So I think it's fair to say that Warhammer 40k is one of the most ridiculous fictional universes ever created. Every single faction seems to be god tier, and it's absolutely baffling why they haven't completely destroyed the universe yet. From giant alien space dinosaurs that literally consume every living thing on a planet and then pop out infinite more dinosaurs, to ancient alien undead robots that have weapons designed to kill gods. Or how about the forces of humanity that may just be regular people at the end of the day, but when you have little regard for human life and can throw millions of soldiers at a problem until it goes away, you're definitely going to rank pretty high on the power tier. But if every single faction is this ridiculous, who is the strongest? Who has the best chance at dominating the entire galaxy? Well, that's what we're going to figure out today as we dive into the 10 most ridiculous and powerful Warhammer factions in existence. And stick around to the end of the video because there's going to be a bonus segment that helps clarify this list and gives you a real good picture of what this galaxy actually looks like. And although this is meant to be a standalone video, it's technically a part two, as the video I made right before this one covered 10 more factions that didn't quite make the cut. So if you don't see your favorites here, they were probably mentioned in the previous one. And before we get started, I've actually hit a massive milestone as a YouTuber. I've got my very first YouTube sponsor and I'm super proud of myself. So that being said, this week's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. And first off, a huge congratulations to Raid, as apparently they're celebrating their third anniversary this month. And considering how this video is all about ranking factions, I'm gonna do the same for Raid. The number three best faction is the Dark Elves. High damage glass cannons with a whole lot of lifesteal, followed by the Demon Spawn at number two, spooky scary demons with a bunch of AoE debuffs, and the orcs take the number one spot, who are super beefy brawlers with buffs that make them even stronger. If you know me, you know that I'm a big fan of the green lads. So to celebrate Raid's third anniversary, this month is going to be huge. They're kicking things off with free gifts for everybody, and not to mention adding a whole bunch of new content and events. We're talking new champions, new artifact sets, and apparently a fully personalized video for every player that shows off their journey and all of their accomplishments. And if that wasn't enough, they have a full month of special events and tournaments planned, with some of their best prizes ever on offer. Right now is potentially the best time to get started in Raid. And if you're not playing Raid yet, hit the link in my description or scan the QR code on the screen. You'll get a special huge birthday package for free that's worth $40. We're talking three champions at once. Misery Cord, Tiger Soul, and Romero. Plus 10 Magic XP Brews, 10 Force XP Brews, and 10 Spirit Brews. All this treasure will be waiting for you right here. And since it's Raid's birthday, the gifts keep coming. All new and existing players can get a bunch of free gifts that are worth more than $25. Once you're in game, after clicking on the links, just enter the promo code three years raid to get your hands on everything. And it's that easy. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you in game. Okay, let's get this video started with number 10, the Tau Empire. So the really interesting thing about the Tau is that they're actually the youngest race in the galaxy. But despite not having been around for as long as the other factions, their technological advancement rates are downright supernatural. You see, they only discovered fire some 3,000 years ago, and yet now they maintain a galactic presence, and with each new sphere expansion, they conquer more territory. And without getting into the motivations of their leaders, because there may or may not be some shady stuff happening there, but the Tau people themselves, honest to God, seem like the closest thing to actual good guys in the 40k franchise. They all collectively believe in this thing known as the greater good, which is basically a creed that states to do the most good for the most people with every action that you take. Now, don't get it twisted. The Tau definitely aren't perfect. They utilize a pretty rigid caste system. And a lot of the times the do the most good for the most people thing kind of boils down to doing the most good for the Tau Empire. Now, it's definitely true that they value peace and diplomacy far more than any other faction in the grim darkness of the far future. But their expansion requires compliance. So the Tau will basically give a new species a hundred different opportunities to join their empire, but at the end of the day, if they still refuse them, uh, let's just say the Tau don't take no for an answer. However, despite the Tau's ruthless technological advancements and their unbelievable progression rate, they're still a relatively small faction. Now, they are an entire empire, so they're going to rank a little bit higher than smaller factions like the Grey Knights or the Sisters, but in the grand scheme of things like the Orcs or the Imperium, they still have a lot of growing to do. And the Tau fleets are undeniably powerful, but one of their major weaknesses is they still haven't mastered faster than light travel. So when they're expanding into new territory, it's comparatively slow when you look at other species that utilize the warp. Now don't get me wrong, not having to rely on the warp to travel through space does have its benefits. It's definitely far safer than going through hell itself, but it is comparatively slower, so they haven't expanded quite as much as other factions. 
And additionally, considering the size of their empire right now, not being able to utilize the warp for travel or even move faster than the speed of light isn't actually that big of a deal for them. Now, all that being said, in the most recent Tau Sphere expansion, they were able to utilize the warp to travel. Let's just say it went really, really, really badly though. And they may or may not have accidentally created a new Chaos God. Now that's not 100% confirmed though, so we'll have to dive into that in another video. But let's just say they still have a lot of learning to do. Despite this, the Tau operate some of the most advanced technology in the galaxy, and at the moment still truly believe in peace and unity. However, due to their smaller numbers, it's unlikely they would win in an all-out war against many of the other factions. If they manage to survive to the year 50k, it's very likely that we would see them take the top spot. But at the present time, they unfortunately rank a little bit lower. In the number 9 slot, we have the Adeptus Custodes. Also known as the 10,000, the Custodians are the royal guard of the God Emperor himself. Every single one of them is immortal and a hero in their own right. You can honestly think of them like an army of anime main characters. They're that ridiculous. They have complete mastery over every form of combat and are trained in every weapon style. In the novel False Gods, one Space Marine remarks that the Custodians fight like a pack of lions, each one being an absolute apex killer in their own right, whereas him and his battle brothers fight more like a pack of wolves, designed to be a unit first and foremost. Additionally, the equipment that the Custodians utilize is unbelievably powerful and valuable. They are given literally the best of the best. Not only is each one an absolute unit of an individual, but they are all incredibly intelligent as well, as a Custodian warrior must become a master of not only combat in all its forms, but in every conceivable path of education. They were the Emperor's royal bodyguards, and had to be as close to his level intellectually as possible. And this is actually kind of difficult to comprehend, because the Emperor at this point in time is literally considered a god. And having to be intelligent enough that you can hold a conversation with God himself is a monumentous accomplishment. And to be fair, they themselves don't consider him a god, and neither did much of humanity when they were originally created. But he was undeniably the greatest human being that ever lived. So honestly, from my perspective, that's still kind of badass. Now the Custodians weren't just his royal bodyguards, they were also his closest friends. And the Emperor knew literally every single one of them by name. They conversed with him, consoled him, and in some instances even offered guidance to the Emperor. To be on the level of a living god, so much so that you can offer guidance to him, requires a mind like no other. It's stated in the lore that every single Custodian is so unbelievably valuable that the only way to actually put a price tag on them is to use entire worlds as the monetary sum. Each one stands around 10 feet tall and are so strong that it takes 15 normal men just to lift their spear. And if all of that is true, I bet you're wondering why they would be so low on the list. The only weakness the Custodes has is similar to other entries on this list, and that's their numbers. Even if they do currently maintain around 10,000 members, which isn't exactly confirmed, that still pales in comparison to even the Space Marines, as it is estimated that there are around 1,000 chapters, each with a cap of 1,000 members. And there's honestly probably far more than the Imperial Records state, as not every single Space Marine chapter is what we call chapter compliant. So there's roughly as many Custodians as around 10 chapters of Space Marines. The second major thing here is that the Custodians had actually failed in their primary mission. They had allowed the Emperor to be mortally wounded by his son Horus. This would induce several thousand years of mourning, where the Custodians basically stayed on Holy Terra, guarding and protecting the Emperor's body from any would-be assassins. And it's unfair to say that during this period of time they were doing nothing, as they were pretty instrumental in ending the rule of George Van Dyer not to mention standing guard over a vault of truly horrific relics. But unlike the other forces of the Imperium, they were no longer taking the fight directly to the enemy itself. However, in recent times this has changed, and the Legio Custodes has become the Adeptus Custodes, and they have set off to bring the fight to the enemies of mankind once again, and satiate their wrath in the blood of heretics. As a single army, they are no doubt the most powerful beings mankind has ever seen, However, they are but 10,000 compared to the million plus space marines or even the 30 trillion active guardsmen. Now that being stated, in a one-on-one -on -one fight, a custodian could probably beat just about anybody on this list, with the exception of maybe a knight. But compared to an entire empire of say the next entry on this list, they're not going to be able to hold their own. In at number 8 we have the Craftworld Eldar. In the 41st millennium, the Eldari Empire is in a fractious state. But of all the different Eldar factions, the Craftworlds are by far the strongest. Not only are they all long-lived and disciplined warriors, but every single one of them is psychically gifted. And although the Psyker Scourge is becoming more commonplace in the 41st millennium, 
by human standards, psychers are still pretty rare, so it's difficult to comprehend an entire species of people who are able to manipulate the warp. Now, the Eldar are long-lived but seldom born, and as such are a dying species. Although, that being said, it wasn't always like this for the Eldar, as after the war in heaven 60 million years ago, they had the largest empire in the entire galaxy. However, millions of years of peace led to them getting kind of weird and experimental, and their hedonism eventually spawned a chaos god, which destroyed their entire society overnight. Now, the craft worlders that we know today were individuals who at the time of the Great Apocalypse were aboard massive ships known as craft worlds. You see, these ships are inconceivably enormous, some being documented as being thousands of miles long. You can think of them as mobile planets. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of different craft worlds, from the craft world of Uthwe or Bailtan, or even the Black Library that the Harlequins protect. But outside of these craft worlds, they really don't maintain much of a galactic presence. They haven't conquered a whole bunch of planets. So in terms of population, they kind of pale in comparison to something like the Imperium, which has a million worlds under its control. Now that being said, compared to humans, the Eldar live impossibly long lives, many of which are thousands of years old. And originally, upon their death, they would be reborn like a phoenix. However, that ability has long since been lost to them as nowadays, as soon as they die, their soul is devoured by Slaanesh. Now, the craft worlders are able to protect themselves using a series of stones known as soul stones, which capture their psychic energy of their soul as soon as they die. The craft worlders are then able to plug these stones into what is known as the Infinity Circuit, which allows the souls of the Eldar departed to basically live forever in the confines of their ships, meaning that the destruction of a single craft world is not just the loss of their home, but of all of their ancestors as well. And these spirits are capable of offering more than just guidance, as they can be plugged into what are known as wraith constructs. Which you can think of like an Eldar Dreadnought. It's a machine constructed entirely of a substance known as wraith bone, and the soul of the departed Eldar is able to take full control over it. Now these things are actually pretty controversial to a lot of Eldari, because they are undoubtedly effective in war, but on the other hand, a lot of them see this as basically necromancy, and that they're not allowing the souls of the departed to finally rest, and instead forcing them back onto the battlefield. Probably one of the most useful things that the Eldar have access to is a parallel dimension known as the Webway. It's a pocket dimension that exists between the physical universe and the Immaterium. Its infinite corridors spread out like roots across the entire galaxy, and it offers a much faster and safer way of travel than utilizing the warp. However, in spite of their undeniable power and abilities, they are still a dying empire. The Eldar death rate far outpaces its birth rate, and despite the fact that the Eldari of the craft world are undoubtedly one of the major players in the galaxy right now, unless something major changes, they are a species that is doomed for inevitable extinction. In the number seven slot, we have the Adeptus Mechanicus. So the Adeptus Mechanicus is a faction of machine-worshipping cultists. They pray to the machine god in order to create and maintain all of the marvels of engineering that humanity is capable of. From the humble LAS rifle to the Gloriana-class battlecruisers, the Adeptus Mechanicus is responsible for all of them. Now, mostly known for the Forge World of Mars, where the Mechanicum originated, they actually control many planets, each known as a Forge World, as the entire thing is basically a giant factory, every square inch of it dedicated to the production of the Imperium's tools of war. Now, to say they control one of the greatest armories of all time is a massive understatement, and each individual member of the Mechanicum is also incredibly intelligent, as they see the pursuit of knowledge as a holy quest, that logic is divine, and there is nothing more holy than calculations. They see flesh as weakness, and thus ritualistically replace more and more of their organic parts with the sanctified metal of their creations. Many of the Mechanicum's individuals no longer even look remotely human. The only thing left that holds them to their origins is potentially a few leftover organs so they can still maintain the moniker of humanity. However, there is a very important distinction to be made here. They do not want to be entirely machine, as thinking machines are forbidden. AI, or abominable intelligence as it is known, is blasphemy, and it spits directly in the face of the Omnissiah. So many of their creations that are still capable of some form of thought have to have a human brain powering them. The vast majority of weaponry used by humanity can trace its origins back to the Mechanicum. They control massive fleets of warships, and not to mention the Titan legions as well. So they are undoubtedly one of the most powerful singular factions in all of humanity. But as far as weaknesses are concerned, they do have a couple. The first is that even though the Adeptus Mechanicus is normally seen as part of the Imperium, 
They do maintain independence and are allowed to operate as basically a free state. This is due to the signing of a document known as the Treaty of Mars. And at the end of the day, if their interests conflict with that of the Imperiums, they'll pursue their own first. Additionally, they are also ruthlessly addicted to tradition. Innovation is seen as heresy. Machines created by humanity at the peak of its power are seen as perfect in all their forms. So to improve upon perfection is blasphemy to their machine god. Now in the novel Mechanicum, we see one of the main characters literally on death row for having committed the ultimate sin of trying to make her workshop goggles just a little bit better. Their superstitions and belief in machine spirits, the idea that every machine literally has a soul, may keep the machines they create functioning. However, they get in the way of making any form of actual progress. They're basically stuck in the dark ages and refuse to move forward. They do, however, have seemingly limitless resources in comparison to the Dark Mechanicum, and those materials will keep the fires of their forges burning for a long time to come. In the number six slot, we have the Chaos Space Marines. The nine traitor legions of the Chaos Space Marines are Astartes that have figuratively and all too often literally sold their souls for power. They are dark and twisted wraiths that lurk deep within the space between universes. Their ranks include the rotting and undying forms of the Death Guard, the mighty and terrible arcane sorcerers of the Thousand Suns, the depraved lunatics of the Emperor's children, and the frothing berserkers of the World Eaters, just to name a few. They are damned and lost souls who once served at the Emperor's side, but betrayed him and everything they ever knew to follow War Master Horus and his great rebellion. Now, after nine years of brutal warfare, the traitor legions were inevitably pushed back and forced to take refuge in the bleeding wound in reality known as the Eye of Terror. There, time flows differently, and many of the traitors that besieged the Imperial Palace 10,000 years ago are still alive today. And to put that in perspective, the Loyalist Marines of the 41st millennium weren't alive back then. The Siege of Terror is all but a legend that has been passed down for several millennia. The traitor legions remember it far too well, as many of them were literally there. So the Chaos Space Marines are what you get when you take a superhuman warrior and then further empower them with the blessings of the Chaos Gods. They're basically an unholy unification of the peak of humanity's gene forging mixed with the arcane sorcery of the warp. Not to mention a whole lot of heresy and blasphemy thrown in for good measure. And on an individual level, a Chaos Space Marine is far stronger than their loyalist counterpart. However, as a cohesive fighting force, the inherent greed and selfishness of the Chaos Space Marines leaves a lot to be desired. And thus, the greatest weakness of Chaos is its lack of unity. The Traitor Legions fight amongst themselves more than they fight any of their other enemies. In the novel Black Legion, we see a gathering of Chaos Space Marines just outside the Eye of Terror, waiting for the new War Master of Chaos, Abaddon the Despoiler, before embarking through the rift into real space. When the War Master finally arrives, he is greeted with constant and non-stop battle, as old grudges and rivalries between the Traitor Warbands runs deep. And in retrospect, gathering them all in one place was sure to incite violence. This occurs for a few reasons. The first is that resources within the Eye of Terror are incredibly scarce. Now in the novel Storm of Iron, we see Chaos Space Marines literally descending upon their recently deceased battle brothers like a pack of vultures, looking to scavenge anything they can from their corpses, whether that be bits of armor, ammunition, or even their weaponry. Everyone is out for themselves. It doesn't matter how powerful you are, if you can't stand united with your brothers and you're constantly expecting one of them to stab you in the back, this is a major weakness that can be easily exploited by your enemy. Not to mention the fact that although the Traitor Marines are able to create new recruits, each warband doing so in their own unique way, their gene seed is incredibly unstable, as it has spent generations being corrupted by the warp. Now on one hand, this can lead to some pretty interesting and useful mutations. However, it makes the implementation of their gene seed far more likely to encounter catastrophic consequences. Now, Abaddon the Despoiler seems to be the only one that's been able to unite the Traitor Legions for his Black Crusades. Even still, this is not perfect unity, Warbands often breaking off to pursue their own interests despite his commands. Now, don't get it twisted. Don't mistake my words for evidence that they are not a threat to mankind, as the arch enemy is getting stronger every day, as the Imperium of Man continues to fracture. And over time, they have been pushing further and further outside of the Eye of Terror and conquering new territory in real space. And recently, we've seen the 13th Black Crusade bear fruit, as Cadia was destroyed and the galaxy was split in half with the forming of the Cicatrix Maledictum, a festering wound that spreads from rim to galactic rim, plunging half of the Imperium into darkness. When the legions are able to set aside their differences for but a moment, calamity ensues. If they were ever to truly unite, the resulting carnage would be catastrophic. But right now, 
Their lack of resources and territory fuel deep feuds, and old wounds and betrayals are never allowed to fully heal. Now tied for the same spot we have the Chaos Demons, and I'm going to add these two together as they're pretty intrinsically linked and it's difficult to comprehend just how powerful demons are. As on one hand, which we're going to get into, they could be the most potentially dangerous faction in the entire galaxy, or the weakest. And if I'm being 100% honest, it's because this list was supposed to have 20 entries and I'm just now realizing there's 21, so I'm going to fix that by adding demons and chaos space marines together. And in my defense, this is exactly where they were going to go on the list anyway, so just think of them at like 5.5. So the Chaos Space Marines are unquestionably powerful individuals. They have been blessed by the Dark Gods and have reached power levels thought impossible by mortals. However, the true power of the Primordial Four rests not in the hands of mankind, but in their demonic servants. Every single demon is a twisted reflection of their paternal deity, and the Chaos Gods and their creations see the physical universe as little more than a diversion. The realm of the physical is but a massive board game to them, the Great Game, as they call it. Nurgle, Slanesh, Zinch, and Korn vie for dominance and see mortals as little more than pawns existing solely for their entertainment. Their corrupting influence spreads far and wide, and each one of them maintains armies of incredibly destructive potential, seemingly with limitless soldiers. If the two realms were to ever merge, and the infinite horrors of the warp were allowed to run free through our universe, mankind would quickly perish, and the universe would inevitably collapse in on itself. However, the denizens of the Realm of Chaos have a massive weakness, and that is that they can't maintain their presence in the physical realm for long periods of time. It normally takes a particularly powerful summoner, or a really egregious act of sustained blasphemy, to allow them to inhabit our realm. The gods do not see this as a problem, as what fun would a game be without limitations? Nevertheless, demons, or the Neverborn as they're often referred to as, make for incredibly potent allies, and when summoned into battle, they'll wreak untold havoc upon the Imperium of Man and any alien force that would dare impede the pursuits of the forces of chaos. So each one of the four gods has different strengths and weaknesses, and are radically different from their siblings. And when they actually manage to set aside their differences and unite, they can create some truly unstoppable armies. You see, the forces of the Blood God are massive and hulking melee monsters. They are literally the personification of violence, whereas the forces of Zinch are all masters of the arcane, and excel in ranged warfare. The demons of Nurgle, however, are incredibly resilient, and each one being ludicrously difficult to put down. Not to mention his armies carry with them demonic plagues that were never meant for our universe. The forces of Slanesh are as beautiful as they are cruel, and their agility is unmatched by any force in the physical universe. To really oversimplify it, you can think of a united demon army as having four major factors, strength, toughness, speed, and magic. And when they all come together, they make for an incredibly dangerous force. There's just one major problem here. The four gods are not united, and war against each other more than anyone else. Something like 99% of all battles that the demons fight in takes place in the realm of chaos, rather than the physical universe. Now, it is said that the Emperor is strong enough to hold them back within the warp, but in reality, he's holding back four individuals that are locked in eternal conflict with each other. If they were somehow able to unite, they would quite literally overpower him. And additionally, if they manage to not become completely dependent on their mortal followers to help them manifest in our universe, they would be by far the most powerful army to have ever existed. Now thankfully for us, this is not the case, and demons rarely ever unite. It's not like this doesn't happen as it has in the past, but normally it's for a very limited amount of time, sometimes being even far less time than they're able to exist in our universe. So that is why it's kind of difficult to quantify just how powerful the Neverborn truly are. But one thing is for sure, they are undeniably one of the strongest forces in the universe. They just have a few major weaknesses that hold them back from the number one spot. And coming in at number five, we have the Adeptus Astartes. Okay, so there's a lot to say about Space Marines, as they make up something like 80% of all Warhammer lore. But in the interest of being fair, we're going to stick to the basics here. They are the poster children for Warhammer 40k, potentially its most iconic warriors. They are transhuman super soldiers, clad in ceramite power armor, each having undergone relentless and rigorous gene therapy and augmentative surgeries, from the time they were children to become the ultimate warriors. 
They are the Imperium's mass-produced super soldiers, and each one is given upgrades such as a third lung or a second heart, a mechanism that allows them to heal from pretty much any injury, or even the ability to spit acid. And they get so much more ridiculous than that. They have one that lets them consume the flesh of their enemy and learn all of their secrets, another one that puts them into a coma if their injuries are so catastrophic that there's no way that they can heal from them, which will basically keep them alive long enough for an apothecary to get to them. And if their injuries are too great for even that of the apothecaries, it's possible that Space Marine will be entombed in a dreadnought, a walking life support tank, basically an iron lung with machine gun hands. And in this way, they'll be able to serve the Emperor indefinitely. The Space Marines are so far removed from normal humans that it's actually really difficult for them to relate to us, as a Space Marine can process information a hundred times faster, and they're practically immortal. We know now that they do age, but just incredibly slowly. The oldest Space Marine on record, Dantioch, having been well over 3,000 years old. And as of the time of this recording, we've never actually seen a Space Marine die from old age, so we don't really know how old they can get. Most Space Marines will end up perishing in the line of duty somewhere between 200 and 400 years into their service. Now, the Space Marines were originally divided into 20 different legions, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, such as the Ultramarines, the Space Marines' master tacticians. And depending on who you ask, the greatest Space Marines that ever lived, who were capable of doing literally everything. There were the Space Wolves, Space Marine Vikings that rode giant wolves into battle and acted as the Emperor's executioners. There was also the Imperial Fists, whose fortresses were said to be completely impenetrable. Or even the Raven Guard, who somehow managed to make eight foot tall super soldiers in thousand pound ceramite armor incredibly stealthy, seemingly able to disappear without a trace and make no sound with every step they took. These are only a couple of the great legions that made up the Space Marine forces. And although all the Space Marines ultimately served the Emperor, each one of them was led by what was known as a Primarch. This was one of the Emperor's 20 sons, a demigod level individual and some of the most powerful beings in the galaxy. The genes he'd used to create their warriors was pulled directly from each of the Primarchs, making each of the Primarchs a figurative and semi-literal father figure to the Space Marines. Nowadays, however, the legions are no more, and the vast majority of the Primarchs are either dead or missing. Space Marines are now divided into chapters of no more than a thousand individuals at any given time. Now, even though this is supposed to be a hard and fast rule, there's a lot of chapters out there that kind of conveniently ignore this requirement. Now, it's difficult to put into perspective just how many Space Marines are out there, but it is estimated to be somewhere around a million. Although the actual number may be far higher as we don't have accurate numbers for all of the chapters. Even still, the Space Marines are one of the greatest fighting forces at mankind's disposal, seemingly able to counter any strategy the enemy may throw at them. So I know what you're thinking here. If the Loyalist and Traitor Space Marines are genetically similar to one another, but one of them has been empowered by the Chaos Gods, then why do the Loyalists actually rank higher? And it's something I've referred to in this video series with a couple of different factions, but the number one thing is unity. You see, Loyalist Marines can count on their brothers to have their backs. And whether that be members of their own chapter or reinforcements from other chapters, they can all work together to accomplish certain goals. Chaos Space Marines are inherently selfish, each one of them pretty much out for themselves above everything else. And yeah, Loyalist Marines may have long-standing grudges between chapters, such as that between the Dark Angels and the Space Wolves, but Chaos Space Marines actively hate each other. One pretty interesting example of this can be found in the 8th edition Death Guard Codex, where it says that they do not view the forces of the Imperium as some great enemy. They just view them as ignorant and deeply misguided. And one day, the Death Guard will show them the error of their ways, and they will be joined together in unity when it comes to worshiping the Grandfather. However, they actively hate the Thousand Sons, as the Thousand Sons know the primordial truth of the universe, yet still choose to follow Magnus. Loyalist Astartes fight like a unified force, whereas the Chaos Space Marines are, for lack of better words, chaotic, which may cause them to be a very difficult enemy to fight as you never really know what you're up against. But in the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, knowing that you actually have brothers that you can rely on is one of the greatest strengths you can ask for. In at number four, we have the Astra Militarum. So the Imperial Guard doesn't get nearly enough credit, and I know there's definitely going to be someone in the comment section that is completely baffled that I would rank them higher than their beloved Ultramarines, but the fact of the matter is that more than 80% of the Imperium's fighting is done by the regular old men and women of the Astra Militarum. The Imperium is made up of many different types of warriors, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, and that's honestly its biggest strength. However, none are more prevalent than that of the Imperial Guard. And I know the majority of the 40k novels tend to focus on space marines or other such individuals clad in power armor, but the reality is that the universe is an incredibly large place, 
And the forces of the Space Marines or the Custodians just can't be everywhere all at once. So the Space Marines tend to act more like a supplement to the main force that is the Guard. It's honestly difficult to wrap your head around just how large the Astra Militarum truly is. They control vast legions of earth-shattering tanks and artillery, and seemingly infinite supplies of human fighters, that drown out their enemy in wave after wave, sent in to crush all those that would stand in the Emperor's way. For every soldier that is killed in combat, there are a hundred more ready to take their place. Now, when I was researching the Guard for this video, I found a lot of different conflicting numbers for them. But the most common figure that I found was that it's estimated there are around 30 trillion active Guardsmen. And that is just such an inconceivable number. Especially when you think about how there are only a million Space Marines. That's, that's honest. Hold on a second, I gotta do some quick maths. Allegra, what's 30 trillion divided by a million? 30 trillion divided by one million is 30 million. That means there are 30 million guardsmen for every single Space Marine. That's absolutely ridiculous. And using the same quick maths, that would mean there are 3 billion guardsmen for every single stowed. I'll be honest with you, I wrote out 30 trillion when I was scripting this out, but I hadn't really put together just how many that was, and I'm a, <laughs> I'm a little bit blown away. The big boys in power armor are pretty powerful, but they're not that powerful. They're not dealing with 30 million or 3 billion guardsmen by themselves. And it's starting to make a lot more sense why many of the sources that I've found point to the Guard as the largest cohesive fighting force in the entire galaxy. Okay, getting back on track. So the Guard's numbers make them masters of attrition style warfare, and they're mankind's first responders to pretty much any threat. Not to mention they're spread out all over the galaxy, maintaining thousands of different regiments and thousands of worlds, all of which are normally in pretty strategic positions ready to respond to any threat, no matter where it may appear. And it's really easy to underestimate these guys since they're essentially just human, especially when you compare them to the limitless threats found in the 40k universe. But the Guard are absolutely no joke, and are by far the most powerful fighting force in the entire Imperium. And that's not even to mention the Imperial Navy, which controls some of the largest fleets in the entire galaxy. And the Imperial Navy, to be fair, can arguably be called a different faction altogether. However, that really depends on what era you're reading about, because during the Grand Crusade, they were both considered part of the same force. And even nowadays, with them being technically separate entities, they're pretty intrinsically linked. The Guard operates as the frontline soldiers, while the Imperial Navy offers air and space support. But I think we've spent enough time on the Guard, so let's get into the top three. And in the number three spot, we have the Orcs. If you thought the numbers of the Guard were ridiculous, the Orcs take it to a whole new level. So the orcs, or the unending green tide as some people like to call them, outnumber humanity a thousand to one. Now that's a rough guesstimate, but that's not just talking about the guard, that's all humans. And across the million worlds of the Imperium, the human population is said to be in the quintillions. Yet despite that absolutely ridiculous number, the orcs still outnumber humanity. And honestly, this makes a lot of sense, as they've been around for 60 million years. When a single orc dies, it sheds a whole bunch of spores, which grow into new orcs and reach maturity in about a year. Each one of them is quantifiably tougher and more dangerous than any normal human, many of which rival even that of the Astartes. You can think of the orcs like a sentient fungus being closer to that of mushrooms than people. They have an organ system very similar to humans, but the major thing about them is that not all of these organs are essential to life, meaning that an orc can suffer grievous injuries that would kill a normal human and keep on fighting. Needless to say, this makes their force incredibly resilient and hard to put down. So not only are the orcs a seemingly unstoppable army that can quickly overrun a planet's defenses, but once a single orc shows up on your planet, the infestation will linger practically indefinitely. The orcs also have this weird type of psychic power that we and even they themselves don't fully understand. It seems like they are able to bend reality to their whims, and in a sense, their beliefs actually become real. An orc psyker, known as a weird boy, may only be able to throw fireballs around because him and the orcs in his vicinity believe that he can. Orc engineers are able to basically smash wood and metal together and create massive war engines or even spaceships. Now, whether or not this is due to their ability to bend reality or some innate knowledge left over in their subconscious from their creators is still unclear. All of these factors combined make for one of the most powerful armies in the entire 41st millennium. However, the orcs are not without their weaknesses. You see, the major problem with the orcs is that they're incredibly ununified. They have no greater goals than to fight. And to be fair, that is what the Old Ones literally bred them for during the War in Heaven. Fighting to the Orcs is like eating or drinking is to humans. If they go too long without a good scrap, they'll get physically sick. And Orcs grow larger based on how many fights they've been in. And theoretically, there's no limit to how large an Orc can get. 
But despite the overwhelming amount of orcs that currently infest the galaxy, you can think of them as millions of unorganized groups just fighting millions of pointless wars in every sector of the galaxy at any given time. There's no major arcing goal for the orcs, they just want to fight. And seeing as how the orcs only care about fighting, they're basically incapable of building an advanced society, because if the orcs run out of enemies to clobber, they'll start fighting themselves. This is what makes the Prophet of War, Gaz Kolthraka, such a threat, as he seems to be able to unite the orcs under his great walk. But as of the time of this recording, even though he's gathered the largest wog that the universe has ever seen, he still hasn't united all of the orcs. If all of the orcs were truly to band together under a single banner and be aimed at Holy Terra itself, it could spell out the end times for humanity. But thankfully, that hasn't happened yet. In the number two spot, we have the Necrons. The technology level of the Necrons is unlike anything we've ever seen before. They are the oldest faction in the galaxy, and the weapons they bring to bear kind of put all of the creations of humanity to shame, as their technology is millions of years past our own. Each individual Necron is an undying warrior, their bodies made of a living metal known as the Necrodermis, that can literally repair itself from all but the most catastrophic of injuries. If the damage is too great, the Necron can phase out of existence and back to the safety of their tomb world, where they can either be fully repaired or their consciousness can be downloaded into a new body, making them basically immortal. The problem with the Necrons is twofold. The first is that not all of the tomb worlds have come online yet. Now the Necrons that have woken back up are split across multiple different dynasties, spread across the entirety of the Milky Way. And although the Necrons are more unified than most species, all of the dynasties have different goals and ambitions, which constantly conflict with one another. And when it comes to arrogance, the Necron may even surpass that of the Eldar, so alliances tend to be rather short-lived. The other major weakness is the ability to repopulate the species as all of the Necrons that currently exist were the Necron tier from 60 million years ago. And the Necron tier went extinct. There is no way to make a new Necron warrior. They can surely build new ships and canoptic constructs, but once a Necron is truly and utterly destroyed, they have no ability to replace them. This is why one of the major goals for the Necrons is to reverse the process of biotransference, which is what made them into the Necrons we know today. You see, the idea is to download the Necron's consciousness into a host species, basically allowing them to pick back up where they left off 60 million years ago. These individuals would trade immortality for a normal life. However, the sentience of the host species would be completely wiped out, so needless to say, humanity is not volunteering for this. To put into perspective just how ludicrous the technology of the Necrons truly is, I want to tell you about this thing known as the Celestial Orrery, which may be the most powerful weapon in existence. You see, it's basically a giant holographic map of the entire galaxy. Every single star, sector, and system are represented in perfect detail, and it actually updates in real time. So not only does the Celestial Orrery act like an incredibly powerful scrying device that gives the Necrons access to insane levels of information, but the dark secret of the Orrery is that if an individual was so inclined, they could literally tap stars out of existence on it. If an individual was to tap one of the motes of light within the celestial orrery that represents a star, the corresponding star in real space would supernova, causing absolutely catastrophic damage. Now thankfully there's one dynasty in particular that guards the orrery and won't let anyone else use it. They see themselves as gardeners of creation, plucking and trimming certain elements out of existence in order to preserve the timeline. Needless to say, many other Necron dynasties would love to get their hands on this thing, but they don't allow it. So it is theoretically possible that the Necrons could just tap Terra out of existence. However, the Oriskar would never allow such a thing to happen, as the resulting consequences on the course of history would be absolutely uncountable. And despite how crazy the truth of the Orrery is, there's actually a fact that's far crazier. You see, during the War in Heaven, the Orrery wasn't completely unique, as there were many creations that were capable of damage on similar scales. Before the Silent King ordered all of the Necrons to go to sleep in their tomb worlds, he ordered the destruction of all of them seeing as no good could come from weapons of such immense destructive capability. However, the Celestial Orrery was given the pass and was allowed to remain functional. So if this thing was seen as safe enough to be allowed to continue to exist, we can only imagine how powerful these other weapons could have been. And it's probably a really good thing for the galaxy that they don't exist anymore. Okay, so we have one faction left to go on this list. And although in my opinion, they are more of a threat to humanity than the Necrons, Ironically, the Necrons probably stand the best chance at beating them compared to every other race in the galaxy. I am talking, of course, about the number one slot, the Tyranids. So it is my opinion that at this moment in time in the 41st millennium, there is no greater threat to the galaxy than that of the Tyranids. They are seemingly infinite in numbers and are able to adapt to any situation. 
They come in infinite variations, each more horrifying than the last, and for all intents and purposes are the ultimate life form. Now I have mentioned the concept of unity many times throughout this video when it comes to determining the power of a certain faction. The Tyranids are possibly the most united faction that has ever existed, as they are all technically the same organism. Every single one of the quintillions of Tyranids in our galaxy are not just the same species, but they are all seemingly part of the same creature. They are all controlled by an impossibly vast intelligence known as the Hivemind, a creature we really don't know much about other than it exists outside of the Milky Way and is able to control all of the Tyranids simultaneously. This means that this thing is able to synchronize incredibly complex battle strategies across billions of battlefields at the same time. This is absolutely unthinkable. Not even the most advanced supercomputers in the world are capable of such a thing. And considering that the hive mind knows literally everything that any single Tyranid has ever learned, and is capable of controlling quintillions of Tyranids at the exact same time, this would put the hive mind on the level of a god. And what's even more horrifying than this is that it is said that all of the Tyranids we have currently seen in the Milky Way are nothing but the Scouts, and that they have already conquered every other galaxy. Now whether or not this is true or not we don't really know, but if it is, it would mean that the Milky Way is the last remaining bastion of sentient species, and once we're gone, there will be nothing but Tyranids. So the Tyranids as a species are supposed to represent the never-ending swarm, wave after wave of horrifying creatures, from an endless plague of gaunts and gene stealers to the massive Hierophant Biotitans, all the way up to their ships, which are technically just massive Tyranids that can measure over 10 miles in length. Now if their numbers weren't terrifying enough, the fact that they're able to adapt quickly to new situations should be equally concerning. The Tyranids are often noted as being something like evolution on steroids. Now when fighting the Tyranids, certain tactics cannot be used for very long as the Tyranids learn and find new ways to counter them incredibly quickly, whether it be through the ability to adapt new strategies to counter the enemy or the fact that they can evolve in any way they need to. The Tyranids are never without options. If the enemy is, say, using enormous amounts of anti-tank rounds, the Tyranids can adapt to have even more armor. Is their target relying heavily on bunkers or fortified positions? Then the Tyranids will just produce more burrowing units to attack from underneath. Too many colossal titans on the battlefield? Well then the Tyranids will just pop out some of their own. There have even been examples of factions like the Death Guard trying to use poison or disease to combat them only for them to quickly develop to be immune. Even Grandfather Nurgle finds the Tyranids unbelievably frustrating to fight. And at this point the Tyranids outnumber even the Orcs. And as long as organic matter for them to consume still exists in our galaxy, there will always be more Tyranids. From my perspective the Tyranids really don't have a weakness that I can point out. They have near perfect unity, they are able to adapt to any new situation, they outnumber every single species in the galaxy combined, and with the help of their gene stealer cults are able to infiltrate any world they want. But if I had to come up with a weakness, the major one that I would point out is they don't have the ability to travel faster than the speed of light, and they don't utilize the warp to travel. At the end of the day, their ships are just migratory animals, so this takes them an incredibly long time to reach their destination. They are giving their enemies an incredibly long time to prepare for them. However, most of the time they don't even get that opportunity as they have this thing known as the shadow in the warp which is a massive psychic disturbance that the Tyranids produce that can shut down psychic powers on the battlefield, but it also renders their fleets almost completely invisible to detection systems. Additionally, the Tyranids do have a reliance on what is known as a synaptic link. You see, the hive mind influence spreads across impossible distances, but it does this through certain Tyranid species that act as a conduit for its commands. Tyranids that get too far out of range of such a link end up reverting into little more than feral beasts. They are still incredibly dangerous. But they are not the unified fighting force that they once were. Every single day that goes by more and more Tyranids are produced, and the noose they have created that is tightening around the throat of the Milky Way galaxy is getting tighter and tighter. With every other major faction in this list there is a lot of ifs, buts and maybes. If the orcs ever manage to make a list of goals and objectives they are going to be incredibly powerful. If Abaddon is able to fully reunite the Chaos Warbands once again, for longer than just a single Black Crusade, it is going to be a major problem. If the Necrons Tomb Worlds start to come online all at once, it is going to be a major problem. If the Tau were allowed to continue advancing for another few thousand years, then they may dominate the galaxy. And as I am sure you can see, there seems to be a pattern here. There is a lot of determining factors when it comes to where they are going to end up in the future. But as of right now, the Tyranids are the apocalyptic level threat. There is no ifs, buts or maybes with the Tyranids. They are definitely the apex predator when it comes to all of the sentient species of the Milky Way, and if things continue as they are going now, we will all end up being nothing more than bug food. 
Now I know this video has run a lot longer than all of my other ones, but if you've made it this far, I feel like a quick explanation for this list needs to be done. Just to give you a clearer picture of what the universe actually looks like. Now it's easy to say that something like the Tau Empire is stronger than the Sisters of Battle. I think this goes without saying. But what you have to remember is that the Sisters, or even the Astra Militarum, only represent one portion of the Imperium as a whole. This goes as well for the forces of the Eldar Empire or the forces of Chaos. When you take these alliances into account, the list starts to look more like this. I would still rate the Tyranids as my number one pick for the most dangerous faction in the entire galaxy. That's not going to change, the bugs are scary. But the Imperium of Man as a unified whole scores a lot higher, whereas something like the Tau Empire ends up back near the bottom of the list. One of these factions is just vastly larger than the other. Now the great thing about the 41st millennium is that you could honestly in good faith make an argument that any one of these factions could potentially be the strongest, if certain criteria are met. But what are your thoughts? Would you change the order of this list? Do you disagree with my top pick? Let me know down in the comments because I'm always curious what you guys think, and if I'm being honest, <laughs> I learn more about Warhammer through the comment section of my videos than pretty much any other source. Anyways, I hope y'all have a great night and happy wargaming.